Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Quest for Faith with Brian. And today I have a special guest, Gary Machuda. And uh, y'all know that Gary has been a great fan of the channel for, for a while. And uh, I was, I've, I don't know, spent the last two years being a guest on your radio show um through the duration there and uh gary i just really appreciate you coming on oh yeah no it's a thrill it like uh we we've had uh on our show we had a lot of fun and covered a lot of ground and uh so now that uh, i'm no longer doing the show it's it's cool to be able to sit on the other side of the mic and 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 chat with you because mm -hmm. you are you are a treasure full of like really great insights and apologetics stuff. And anyway, it's always, I appreciate that. I, yeah. and it, I, likewise, I love getting your insight on things. Cause yeah, you're, you're so well studied on everything. So, but today's topic, uh, we're going to be talking about the once saved, always save, uh, concept that you see pop up when in Protestantism and, um, and I figured we could start the conversation off talking about, um, we could go into the origins of that. Um, but I think where, I think I want to start off where we kind of see that in fruition today, the way we see it in our society today. And growing up Church of Christ, this wasn't a concept that Church of Christ doesn't believe this, um, but it wasn't explicitly taught against. And it could be because I don't think this was a, um, I feel like in the 90s and 2000s, this became more of a uh, widespread concept in in uh, evangelical non-denominational uh, Protestantism um, than it was maybe in the 80s. Or it just could have been my circle of, of like, it was pretty isolated circle. All my friends were Church of Christ. All the families I hung out with the Church of Christ, so it wasn't a topic that we necessarily had to breach. Um, but for me, what I see with this "once saved, always save," it it it, it makes you. I don't know. I feel like it it leads to becoming a pretty lazy Christian, um, where you get the concept I'm I'm spiritual but not religious and. I that that just drives me nuts because what that really says to me is, yeah, I believe that Christ was saved. Uh, that's that Christ was saved. That Christ died uh, died on the cross for our sins to save us. But I don't really want to do anything about it. Um, I, you know that that's where I that's where I end. And so because I've uh, either said a prayer to ask <laughs> ask the Lord into my heart um, or hopefully I was baptized, uh, I'm saved and I don't have to do anything past that. Yeah. So yeah. What's your take on what, how you see it uh, folding out today? Yeah. Um, I, I think you, you're on to something there as far as see when I first started, like in the early nineties in apologetics, this was kind of a mainstay for Protestant fundamentalists. You know, once saved, always saved. That was, uh, like a big, big issue. And I, I think you're right. I think that the older rigid, more rigid belief in that has kind of faded and become popularized. So it's like, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus and that's enough. And I don't really have to be concerned about losing it because after all, I'm in Christ's grace and, and uh, you know, I basically there's nothing I need to do if i didn't have to do anything to be saved i don't have to do anything once i'm saved yeah and and i think a lot of this stems from i mean you got luther calvin this really stems from the the beginning in the first part of uh of the protestant reformation um is where this all started mm -hmm. um and i think a lot of it does fall on luther with with the faith alone argument that, that he started with and, and Luther's with, I don't know when you really read into who Luther was and you, you're not reading Luther fan fan mail. <laughs> um, it's really interesting to read that. Wow. This guy was going to, uh, when he was in Rome, uh, I was reading a, uh, uh, I can't, I can't remember when this was or 
what the author was, but he was talking about how Luther was going to confession all the time to the point where the priests that were hearing his confession were like, Luther, dude, relax. You're good. Right. Right. That's you don't need to be coming to confession every time that, that you have an intrusive thought. Um, and so he was really concerned with, uh, with his, with the way that he was, uh, acting and afraid that he was going to lose his salvation. So I think it makes sense that when he started the, his, his branch of the reformation, it's like, well, let's fix that and homing in on, on faith alone arguments to, to kind of kick that off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Although, uh, well, Lutherans, if I remember correctly, I believe they they do believe you can lose your salvation, but it's through apostasy. Yeah. Uh, yep. So it isn't like mortal sins or anything like that. But you're right, though. I, it was uh, he had the scrupulosity mm -hmm. that uh, he just couldn't get rid of. And he, he only unburdened himself by uh, discovering, quote unquote, you know, or rediscovering the gospel of, of uh, salvation by faith alone. And, uh, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, the other reformers kind of picked up the ball and ran with it. Kelvin certainly has this idea of, you know, he adds predestination into the mix. Yep. And uh, if you are elect, then you are going to heaven, you know, basically no matter what. Yeah, and predestination with, with Calvinism is really weird because it's like, it's based off your works because if you all of a sudden start acting bad and you start sinning like crazy and you're no longer going to church anymore, then it's like, well, you weren't one of the elect. Yeah. Like, like yeah. It, it's just, it's a weird twist on it. Um, yeah. He even says that like God will give you a kind of a, a grace that simulates that you're elect, but, uh, but it, it, it's not sufficient to actually bring you to, the heavenly gates so yeah. it's almost like god kind of deceives us by giving a, us a, an inferior grace uh so you know yeah i think when push comes to the shove even with calvinism you can't really know whether you're elect or not if what calvin taught was true yeah yeah i agree and, and this whole idea of so like i said i wasn't raised with with this concept i always was raised that you could lose your salvation you could go to hell um, but it was interesting when I, you know, went to adulthood, I'm in my twenties, even though it wasn't, I, I wasn't going to churches that, um, taught this, mm -hmm. but I don't remember ever having any church specifically preach against it. And so this idea of once saved, always saved, I think in American, uh, uh, Protestantism is almost culturally based now to where it kind of seeps into your theology, whether you know it or not. Um, it, it's just kind of in the back of your mind when you're on, at least it was for me. Mm -hmm. um, not that I, and especially cause there was no mechanism other than just saying a prayer every now and then asking God to forgive you for, for your sins. And it would typically only pop in your head when you're like, man, I cannot believe I just did that. Okay, Lord, you know, yeah. <laughs> it would be right. one of those. Um, and so I think for me, it started slightly creeping in, but it, it's that idea of, oh, I'm a good person, you know, and not, not that just being a good person doesn't get you there. Right. And so, uh, let, let's kind of turn to scripture and start talking through uh, a few of the different verses. And, um, I know we wanted to, let, let's start with, uh, was it John, John six, you were saying that yeah. you wanted to start with. Yeah, you know, eternal security can only be held to it if you take certain passages and absolutize a particular interpretation of them. And that's why, uh, like we were talking before we start recording that, this is kind of a favorite theological pinata for Catholic apologists because everything else in the New Testament speaks against it, you know, except for these passages, and only if you read them in a certain way. And uh, so it, it's really it's easy to debunk if you go to outside of these key passages. But what I'd like to do is look at some of the key passages and show that their interpretation is wrong. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, in that series that I have on is salvation guaranteed. That's why I point out so within 
Protestantism, when they approach scripture, they have these like trump verses, like all scripture isn't equal. There are some verses that are more clear than other verses. And those more clear verses are kind of like trump cards in, in a card game. They can overrule lesser verses, right? So there's like four or five uh, trump passages that once saved, always saves, hold on to. So John 6 is one of those. And I have a kind of unique take on John 6. Um, so, okay, let's go to John 6, verse 37. Okay. Everyone that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. So, okay, so every everyone that the Father gives me, Jesus, uh, will come to me. So they're kind of moved and predestined to come to me, and I won't reject any. And then he says, because I come down from heaven, not to do uh, my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Then verse 39, and this is the will of sent, uh, the one who sent me, that I should not lose any of what he gave me, but I should raise it on the last day. So you could look at that and say, see, uh, I, I was given to Jesus by the Father. I came to Jesus. And Jesus says, everyone who's given to me, I will not lose. So if you are, if you believe in Jesus, you'll never be lost. And, and then they'll, they'll also pair in with this John 10 about the sheep hearing his voice. And, uh, you know, no one can take him out of the Father's hand. No one can take him out of my hand, that type of thing. And, uh, and then later on, uh, a few verses later in 44, Jesus kind of summarizes and said, no one could come to me unless the father who sent him draw him and I will raise him up on the last day. So it seems like a pretty open and shut case, right? If you come yeah. to Jesus, you're given by to him by the father. Jesus won't lose anybody and you'll raise you up on the last day. Okay. Now, what I usually point out to people is verse 40. Because right after he says, I should not lose any of that he gave me, but I should raise him up on the last day. He says, for this is the will of the Father. Okay, so now he's explaining what's the will of the Father and giving him these people. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. Now notice Jesus adds a, a, a few or two qualifications, right? Everyone yeah. who sees the Son and believes. Now, that should be the first warning sign for the once saved, always saved. Because, yes, you believe in Jesus, but did you see Jesus? Right? Right. We don't see Jesus 2,000 years after the fact, at least not with our physical eyes, right? So this kind of suggests that Jesus here isn't talking about a universally applied principle throughout time, right? Everyone who comes to yeah. Jesus will be saved and so on. But specifically those who actually physically saw him and believed in him. Okay. So just put that in your back pocket because that's easy to, to blip over because it doesn't make sense if you're trying to look at this as once saved, always saved. So, and this is one of those, you know, during the bread of life discourse in John 6, it's one of those digressions Jesus makes that doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. It's like he's talking about the, the bread he's going to give and so on. And then he, he goes and does these digressions about the father giving them and not losing anyone. Um, so at the very end of the John 6, you know, just he says uh, in John 6, 64, he says, some of you, but there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning is the one who would not believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless he is granted him by my father. So, right. And, so, and I also, yeah, real quick point out on four, on verse uh, 40. Was it? Uh, yeah. It says, uh, believe in, in him and may have eternal life. It's not yeah. will have eternal life. So. It's like, it's not a definite, right? Like if it was, you will have eternal life. It's more of a may, like you have the possibility of, but yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. 
Oh no, that's <laughs> you're on a yeah, roll. Yeah, that's that's important. But notice, so Jesus explains the reason why he did this digression, right? It seems to be because he wants to point out that there is one that apparently came to Jesus, but he's going to betray Jesus. And so Jesus wants the apostles to know that this is done because this is the plan of the Father. Right? Judas wasn't among those that saw and believed in him, right? Okay, but it even gets worse, right? Because um later on in John, in John 17, 12, okay. I'll give you a second to, to flip to John 17, yeah. 12. Uh, this is the high priestly prayer. Jesus is praying to the Father. And he says, when I was with them, I protected them in your name that you gave me. And I guarded them. And none of them was lost except the son of destruction in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. And that's the scripture he quoted earlier in John 13, 18, which is Psalm 41, 9, about the, the one who ate my food has raised his heel against me. Okay, but notice he kind of harkens back to I didn't lose anybody. Right. He's right. praying to the father. I didn't lose any of those that you gave me. And this is within the context of the high priestly prayer with the apostles. But the kicker, uh, Brian, <laughs> for me is John 18, 9. In John 18, 9, Jesus says, well, actually, this is where Jesus is handed over. He's betrayed. So they said, you know, he says, who are you looking for? And he said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you, I am. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. And then in verse 9, it says, this was to fulfill what he said. I have not lost any of those whom you gave me. Huh. What does that refer to? Way back. Well, it refers back to John 17, 12, which refers back to John 6, 44. That everyone that the Father gives Jesus, he will not lose, right? Well, that's actually fulfilled in John 18, 6. Yeah. So that, that's proof that this isn't just a principle that we can apply to all Christians throughout time. Rather, this is a specific thing that Jesus is saying about the apostles to, to warn them that there is one of you that will betray me. He wasn't given to me by the Father. He he saw me, but he didn't believe. Right. And I think, and I think, I think it's interesting on John six, because I've heard uh, talks on uh, uh, that Judas at that point, the bread of life discord is where the real doubt and disbelief started coming in. Yeah. Right. And I think right. um, it says uh, right there. And I think it's a uh, verse. Do 66 and John yeah. John 6 66 because uh, because of this many of his disciples turned his back and no longer went went with him and I feel like at this point Judas felt like he was part of it he was part of the 12 and and for him he lost his belief at that point but was too chicken you know to be like no I'm gone but it yeah. was also to you know he needed to be there to fulfill pro uh, prophecy so right um, but yeah, no, I think you're right on that. That that's a great take on that. Yeah, yeah, that's it's a different one that you don't see elsewhere. But yeah, I, I don't know how you can get out of that. This is fulfilled because obviously it couldn't be fulfilled if till the end of time, everyone who comes to Jesus is given by the Father. And I think the difficulty though is there is a theological principle that's true there, right? I mean, yeah. Even within Catholic theology, we believe in prevenient grace, that God gives us the grace to, to believe, to pray, to, to desire uh, salvation, and, uh, and that God gives us the grace to sustain us in that. Um, but the problem is, you know, these specific words, which seems to be so tightly wound, um, which you pointed out really isn't that tightly wound, um, it just falls apart, like you can't use this passage. And this is one of those key pillar passages that are absolutized by once saved always save folks yeah a hundred percent and i think a, another verse that's problematic for the once saved always save uh is uh matthew 7 okay. um and uh, not everyone who says to me uh, verse 21 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who, who does the will of my Father in heaven. Uh, on that day, many who uh, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Like, that's a scary verse. You, you think about somebody that's actually doing that in Jesus's name and they're going to come at the, the end for their, for their uh, initial judgment and how many people are going to fall into that bucket. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's a man. I don't even know how that that's like a, I don't know. That one just it always creeps me out. That's it. <laughs> my head all the time. I don't want to be one of the, please, you know? Right. Um, but it's obvious you could still believe that Jesus is Lord. Um, you can be doing everything you can except the, what the will of the father, right? Like it, I think, I think this is more of those, the Pharisee types, right? I think that's what he's talking about. Those that, um, like to, like to, um, announce that they're fasting and pray aloud that they're better than other people. Like, like those types, I feel like is what this verse is talking to. Um, but man, I don't, that, that just kind of cuts the whole once saved, always save, uh, right, right at the knees. Yeah. This verse. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, uh, reputation of once saved, always saved see Bible. Right. It's like yeah. the only the only way you can hold it is by holding on to those those passages like John six and that. Uh, but, you know, this brings up a really important point, too. Um, for example, uh, like I mentioned earlier, before we came on, if you look at all the judgment scenes in Scripture, both Old and New Testament, whenever they, they talk about the final judgment, you know, the separation of the, the sheep and the goats, it's always we're judged on the basis of our works and we're never judged on the basis of our faith alone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's remarkable because, I mean, we're talking dozens and dozens of passages where, it, you know, it says that we'll be judged according to our works, according to our deeds. And for once saved, always saved, that causes a huge difficulty, right? Because, it's by faith alone that you're justified. And for the once saved, always saved, that means that you're ultimately, you're going to be going to heaven, right? Yep. So, so how they square that circle is they will propose something like this. They will say, well, if you truly are saved, and we could talk about that too. If you truly are saved, you really do believe in Jesus and accept him as your personal Lord and Savior, then you must necessarily do the good works. Like, uh, you have no choice but to uh, do all those good works by which when the final judgment comes, Jesus will give you the A-OK -okay and you'll go to heaven. Yeah. So like the good works have to necessarily follow like light and smoke would naturally follow from a fire. If you don't have light and smoke, you don't have a fire. That's a great analogy. And it's funny because I'm working on uh, I'm working. I'm working on putting together a video with um, another convert, and we're going to be talking about um, Protestant language that confuses Catholics. Because we normally talk about it the other way around, right? <laughs> yeah. Like Catholic language that confuses Protestants. But we thought this would be an awesome idea. But I, I got yeah. this concept because I was watching this channel where these uh, it's street preachers, and they're pulling these college kids aside, and uh, and this one video it's a it's a catholic that he went through confirmation fairly late because i he looks to be college age and he said he went through confirmation the year before but he doesn't know his faith that well and the way they're talking with him it was it was really interesting because they were harping on him about no it's nothing you can do you can't earn your salvation and and because he's like well i still need to work on this i'm trying not to sin i'm i'm trying to be a you know uh, do more of the Lord's work or will. And they go into explaining, well, no, after you're saved, then it's the Holy spirit that guides you to do good works and you work out your salvation that way. And I'm like, y'all just literally gave us the definition 
of the Catholic view on faith and works. That is yeah. through the Holy Spirit. It's your belief in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior that causes you to do these good works. It's it's not we've done these good works because of of the t of the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I think it's uh it's just fascinating um how things can get twisted around um that they don't think they believe in works but they look at a murderer or a rapist or somebody of that of that nature and they're like well they're going to hell i'm like well they could be saved you don't know i mean we really don't right i mean we up until the last minute that's why christ is amazing that uh he constantly is forgiving us you know through uh through penance so yeah. um yeah i i think that's that's awesome um so I wanted to, one other verse that I usually get thrown at me about the once saved, always saved, and it goes, goes into, into more of a translational difference is that John 3, 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, I want to take a look at that for a second and I'm going to pull it up. Um, so I'm going to look at it here in a few different uh, translations to make sure I have the Catholic one on right now. Let me go to NIV. Um, but I'll, I'll read the Catholic one first, the one I, ha I have up right now. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his own, his only son. And so whoever believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life is the new revised standard version in Catholic edition. But if I go to say, let's see here, let me pull up. Uh, where is it? Trying to pull up the NIV. I got the NASB up if you yeah. want to read it. Go ahead, read that one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So it, it seems very definite. Yeah, and that's, uh, I just finally got NIV up. That's word for word what the NIV says too. Okay. And so the fact that I most most Protestants, I think, at least in my in my group, Protestants, NIV was the translation everybody was using, right? And so right. you read that, and it's like, oh, I'll, I just have to believe, and I'm not going to perish, and I'll have eternal life. And, right. and it's pretty simple. But you had some takes on that uh, that um, that I thought was kind of interesting. I think you were talking about verse uh, 15, was it, is what you said? Let me see. Um, Whoever believes actually here let me go let me go a little further down so um i i think we, we were talking before and i was talking about how i had an individual uh trying to argue and it's like no oh, look john 3 16 and obviously he's using an niv type translation mm -hmm. but i was reading further down and we'll just go i'll just keep going from starting at 17 for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of, of God's only, uh, God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light comes into the world, but people love the darkness and instead of light uh, because the deeds were evil. Their deeds were evil. Interesting. Everyone who does evil, evil hates the light and who does not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed, but whoever lives by the truth comes into light, and so that so that it may uh, be seen plainly that what they have done has has been done in the sight of God. And for me, when you read through that, it's there's deeds in there, there's works in there, there's everything's going to be exposed. God knows it's all happening, and if you you have that choice and it's not a one one or done and that like the the more you read into that i think niv is an awful translation the more and more i, I learn <laughs> that translation i can't stand it um i can't believe i read it so much as a kid growing up but i mean that's what i was given um yeah. but i think that all has to do with deeds people who do evil you love the darkness we're drawn to it from original sin um we have a, a we have a, a unfortunately instinct to try and do evil 
And it's only God's grace that draws us out of that darkness and calls us to the light. And it's not just believing we have to go to the light. It's not that we just, we can, oh yeah, I see Christ over there. He's, he's God, but I'm going to sit here in this evil, filthy darkness and do evil deeds. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I just, yeah. Yeah. I and, not that bad. Yeah. And, you know, as you pointed out too, that verse 15 and 16, um, well, I mean, it's not just the NIV. I mean, the NA. SB, which is usually uh, translation pastors will use because normally uh, it's very strict about rendering verbs correctly. Mm -hmm. Except in this case, in, in 15, I have the Greek in front of me. You know, it's uh, the NASB says, whoever believes in me will, uh, whoever believes will in him have eternal life. So will. OK, very definite. And uh, in 16, it says, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So it sounds like it's definite, right? Yep. But in the Greek, in both cases, it's in the subjunctive, which means may, or it's possible that you might not. So in verse 15, I'm looking at the Greek here. It says, the one who believes in him uh, may have eternal life. And this the uh, then it says that God loves the world that, uh, that um, He gave His only begotten for the purpose that all who believe, all the ones believing in Him, uh, may not perish. So may perish, uh, may not perish. Yeah. This is the subjunctive, but have, and again that's subjunctive, may have eternal life. So. It, it, you know, even though, you know, these translations make it sound like it's a lock, like you believe and therefore you have eternal life. Uh, the Greek is actually doesn't have that rigid, you know, cause and effect uh, between belief and eternal life, which fits in perfectly with what you were showing in the context is that there is this aspect of good works as well. Yeah. And I. <laughs> It amazes me how important your translate the translation of the Bible you're actually using is when you're reading a scripture, um, yeah. because like the the well, actually what's the new? There's so many different ones you can go through, and it, uh, any topic you go through, like if you're an NIV reader as a Protestant, you're going to think tradition is the worst thing ever. And that's probably why uh, Church of Christ loves the either it's either the King James or it's the NIV. Um, like my generation was definitely raised more on the NIV where like my grandparents were King James or the new King James version. Um, and so having this tilt in scripture with translations, that's a big difference in the meaning of that verse when you go from may to will. Uh, it's completely changes the tone of that, of that verse. And it's so popular now because I guarantee you, you just ask anybody on the street and they're, and you ask them to say, John three 16, they're going to say, we'll have eternal life. They're not going to say may have eternal life. Yeah. And I think it's, it's been detrimental to, to this whole concept of once saved, always save and just made it, broadly apparent uh or not apparent that's not the right word uh spread throughout all of protestantism yeah yeah very good yeah i'm just going i'm on bible hub just looking at all the different translations it's only a few actually give the subjunctive um and those are usually the the more literal ones uh dewey reams has uh may have eternal life of course that's a catholic translation uh new revised standard version yep. has may um uh, young's literal translation has may but uh majority of them have have you know that is definite yeah. and so you, you can't translate without you know you have to translate with a wider theological view too so it can it can affect how you're going to render certain verses yeah, and the King James does the uh, King James is for God so loved the world that He uh, gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah. So it it goes that way too, yeah. and you think of the 
the the impact that the new king or the king james version has had on protestantism right. um that i mean i know you've run into this that you would almost think that the king james was the one that uh, version was the one that uh paul was was uh going yeah, through right. uh, uh the first century uh preaching with so um right. it's it's really high regard and high esteem and um a lot of that just it i don't know it it, it was disconcerting to learn that on, on my conversion process that you really had to spend time looking at the greek like what does this mean uh how how um is this actually what what the greek says and the the beautiful thing i think today and i know we're getting back in more in the biblical and the ones they've always said but i think it's still worth looking at so if anyone's watching this that's thinking about becoming catholic but you have these concepts in your head where no we there's no works involved in this there where it's once saved always saved start it's so easy to look up the greek now but <laughs> with the internet it's literally a google search and you can pull up go ahead and pull up a protestant run website that has the greek translations there and it's going to do the same as the catholic run websites with the greek translations like there's no variation there and i've believe me i checked because i was trying to prove the catholicism was wrong you know five years ago so i went through all that um but there's almost no excuse now when you're doing biblical when when you're when you're looking at passages and you're noticing translational differences it's like well what does the greek say and you can go back and look um where i think 20 years ago 30 years ago and and later you actually kind of had to know Greek or you had to go get a, uh, a book and, and it's not like those were totally readily available. You know, you'd probably have to back in the days when we had to wait uh, two to three weeks to get something in the mail. Like it wasn't as easy as it is today. So I always encourage anybody when you're, when you're doing a Bible study and you're maybe jumping back and forth and you notice that your friend's translation is different than what you're reading and it may and it draws a question in your mind go look at the greek and see what it says originally because it's easily available today right yeah more than ever i mean there really is no excuse like you said yeah i think uh before there was like yeah there's no way in the in the for me in the 80s and 90s that i was going to be able to do the greek translation i was going to completely have to take my pastor's word on if he said well the greek word used here is this I'd be like sounds good you know now i don't have to do that i can go does it and look into it yeah um, even even looking at different translations you just go on bible hub or one of these websites you could look at like 20 different translations you know back in the early 90s i i had to accumulate like two bookshelves full of or actually three bookshelves full of translations like physical bibles so that i could look and see all the different things and most people don't have like three bookshelves full of different translations now it only takes a second it would take me probably a good hour or two to look up a verse in all those different bibles yep yep for sure so let's let's kind of turn here for the in the last little bit here and look at one of the let's i like your trump verses i'm trying to i'm going to pull one of those up because i was thinking is it um romans 328 that's it right uh let me pull that up that's the works uh that man is justified by faith and not by works or not by yep. the law that one Man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, which is, though, that's the New King James Version. I'm still in that. Okay. That's actually a really good translation. Yeah. Because it totally trumps what, what, if you look at a lot of the other uh, newer translations, um, it's justified by faith and they don't, they, and not works of the law. But this one always got me um, because even as a Protestant, I never understood this argument because it was obviously he was talking about the law as in following um following the works of the law which is a very jewish concept um and not not one of your your daily life the i know i'm saying that wrong but 
kind of where, where have you gone with this argument uh, when you've had this come up, when people bring this uh, uh, scripture up and trying to say faith alone, that you don't need works? Yeah. Um, well, that one, uh, you know, it's it, what they try to do is take that verse and say, see, what, it, uh, what Paul is doing here is he's placing in opposition faith versus anything you do. Okay. And that includes uh, Old Testament ceremonial law. It includes keeping the commandments. It involves anything that you do. That is opposed to faith. And so, therefore, when Luther added the word alone in his translation, that a man is justified by faith alone, apart from works law, that he was justified in doing that, because pun intended, because, uh, you know, he said, Paul is setting faith against all works, you know, regardless. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, there's a couple ways you can defeat that, but probably the easiest one is just go to the next verse. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because it's very clear that Paul has something more specific in mind. He's not setting faith against all good works. In fact, it never condemns good works. Uh, Paul is, uh, is putting in opposition faith versus a specific kind of works that is specifically Jewish, right? Yep. Because good works are done by Gentiles, they could be done by Jews. But in 29, it says, does God belong to the Jews only? Does he not also, does he not belong to the Gentiles too? Yes, also to the Gentiles. So that uh, God is one and will justify the circumcised on the basis of faith and uncircumcised through faith. So uh, so he, clearly, you know, the, the works of law there is something specifically Jewish, and, and that's the, the ceremonial law. And in fact, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we, we have evidence of that fact that, that the words uh, works of the law specifically means those things that separated Jews from the rest of the world, like circumcision, right. dietary regulations, and stuff like that. Which we see, uh, we see that uh, art that hashed out in the, in the uh, Council of Jerusalem, the first Council mm -hmm. of Jerusalem. Yeah. Right. And we also see um, Peter having that dream where he can eat anything that's that they don't have to worry about unclean foods anymore. Um, yeah. Those are works of the laws that he's talking about here yeah. and and trying to make sure that uh, that the Jews are understanding this. Hey, these Gentiles are Christians, just like you are followers of the way was probably what they would call themselves at yeah. this point. Um, and. And it's not specifically faith, uh, faith alone. And what drives me nuts is when I hear uh, Protestants go, no, see, the Catholics just believe that you have to earn your salvation. And we don't, the way I, I picture this, and you can art probably articulate it better than me, is that, no, I don't earn my salvation, but I can sure as heck lose it. You know, like I, I, Christ died on the cross and opened the gates of heaven for me. And if I do the father's will, I can get into heaven. Yeah. But if I decide not to do the father's will without repenting and, and doing my penance and going to confession, um, then I'm at risk of losing my salvation. I didn't earn it. It's a free gift, but it's my choice my free will to say, I'll take your gift with the literal strings attached mm -hmm. or I'm going to reject it because I don't want to do those other things. Yeah. Yeah. Salvation in the New Testament is described as our inheritance given as children. Right. And it's not like we think that, well, you know, as a child, if I mow the lawn and I do all these things that my dad wants me to do that, therefore I earn my inheritance. Right. That's not true. You, you have your inheritance in virtue of you being a son. But although you can't earn your inheritance, you can lose your inheritance, right? And, and scripture is really clear on uh, that you can lose your inheritance. And if you don't repent, you know, at, uh, before your death, um, you will be disinherited. And actually, this, this is a great segue for John 15. Do you want to talk yeah, about John Yeah, let's go into that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because this is exactly what's going on there. Now, you know, earlier I mentioned with the once saved, the always saved, they have this rigid connection between if you're truly saved, you must necessarily do the good works by which you'll be judged and go to heaven, right? So the trick is to find some passage in scripture 
that shows that somebody could be truly saved and yet not uh, enter into heaven, right? And that's why a lot of proof text, I think, that Christians bring up against once saved, always saved kind of falls because people could always say, you know, they can spiritualize it. They can explain it away either. Well, that example, the person wasn't truly saved or this is a special example or something like that. Uh, like, for example, in uh, uh, in Psalm 51, you know, David says, uh, do not drive me from your presence. Do not take the Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Sounds like, you know, after sinning by killing Uriah the Hittite, right, that he lost his salvation. But they can say, well, no, it wasn't. He didn't actually believe it. You know, he just he's just saying this because, uh, you know, he's 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 afraid of uh, what would have happened or something like that. They'll explain yeah, yeah. it away. Yeah. But when it comes to John 15, this is really this is such a simple passage, and yet it's one of the most difficult passages for once saved, always saved to explain because it's very clear you could be in Christ, you could be saved and yet fall away. So I'm, I'm just going to read here, starting in John 15, 1. I am the true vine, my father is the vine grower. So Jesus is the vine, okay? He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and everyone that does, he prunes to bear more fruit. And he says, you have already been pruned because of the word in which I spoke to you. Remain in me as I in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit unless it remains in the vine, that's exactly what you were saying. You know, this is the Catholic view. In fact, Council Trent quotes John 15, you know, or, yeah. or references it. That, you know, the good works that we do is in virtue of us being united in Christ. We are in the vine who is Christ. But we have to remain in the vine. We have to abide in the vine in order to bear fruit. And so he says, um, unless you remain in the vine, you can neither, uh, wait, I'm uh, sorry. Unless, uh, so neither can you, unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you and the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me, you can do nothing. Okay, let's just stop right there. To be in Christ in the New Testament means you're saved. I mean, do a word search in Christ. Uh, John 17, 21, Romans 8, 1, Romans 12, 5, 1 Corinthians 1, 4, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Galatians 3, 26, Ephesians 1, 7, 8, Ephesians 2, 10, all this stuff, every time it says in Christ, it's clear this is somebody who's saved. So saved people are in Christ. There's no doubt about that. Yep. Now, for one saved, always saved, Brian, if you are in Christ, that means you're truly saved. That means you must necessarily do the good works by which you'll enter heaven, right? But, so fruit. that means every branch should bear fruit, according to this analogy in John 15 according to the one saved, they'll be saved. Yeah. But Jesus says in John 6, anyone who does not remain in me will be thrown out like a branch and wither, and people will gather them and throw them into fire where they're burned. Okay. So notice that some of the branches, they're in Christ, they're truly saved, yet they don't remain in Christ, and so they don't bear fruit. And therefore, they're cut off from Christ, okay, and they're burned. So it's clear, you know, one person said to me, well, these are, these are people that really weren't truly saved. Well, how can you, re you know, how can you remain somewhere that you never were, right? How right. can you remain seated if you never sat <laughs> or remain standing if you never stood, right? Obviously, they were in, in the, the, the vine. John Kelvin does a psychoanalysis on this verse, and he says, well, this is talking about people who think they're safe. But, you know, this, this uh, passage isn't given from the perspective of the branches. It's given from the perspective of the father who's the vine grower. So that right. doesn't work. And then there's some people who say, well, being cut off and burned, this is, a, what is it, um, uh, J. Vernon McGee. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Baptist uh, 
radio preacher, he said that being burned was purification. So if you, you don't do the good works, then you'll be purified. Okay, which is kind of funny because that's actually sounds more like uh, purgatory. But right. it's not because in purgatory, you're sanctified because of Christ. You're still in the vine, right? But these are yeah. people that are cut off from the vine. And uh, of course, it's you like know, he's trying to tie in First Corinthians chapter three. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but I, it really it is a train wreck that interpretation because in First Corinthians three, you know, this is the purification of metals, right? Uh, gold and silver is purified by fire; it burns off the dross, and yep. the wood, hay, and stubble gets burned up completely, right? But there's no metal in this passage. No. These are vines, and you don't purify vines by fire. You destroy vines by fire. So uh, so that, you know, all the escape routes from John 15 just utterly fail. Um, this is talking about people who remain in the vine. They bear good fruit, but it's also possible that you don't remain and you don't bear fruit. And when it comes to a final judgment, right, when it's the harvest time, uh, the branches that bear fruit, uh, those will be saved. The ones that don't will be cut off and burned. In other words, they'll be damned. Yeah, and I mean, that goes back to uh, uh, Christ talking about this, the, spread, the sowing of the seeds. You know, it's the same thing where yeah. th they might sprout up really quick and then die and wither. Yeah. And depending on where the, where the soil or foundation they're in, um, and again, it's it's that's obviously that that parable is definitely not going into a once saved, always saved uh, uh, scenario at all, because, yeah, you could totally believe sprout up really quick. But because you were um, on harsh soil, you die quickly Yeah, um, or, or, or you never strangled. grow at all. Yeah. yeah, they get strangled by the, the, um, the by the um, weeds. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and he even interprets that as like the care and riches of the world, right? He even interprets that parable. Of course, the, and this is another tactic too, Brian, that uh, I've heard on the radio uh, that they'll do in a sermon on John 15, they'll say, this is the most difficult to understand because it's a parable. And so we don't really, we can't get dogma from parables. But this this isn't a parable, this is an analogy, right? Yeah, well, so it's the seed one. I, I misspoke there, it's not a parable. Yeah, that was definitely an analogy. And and we can, I mean, Jesus can teach in all sorts of different ways. You know, it, it, that's totally false that you can't get doctrine from, even from parables, right? Jesus explains the parables. Um, yeah, it's just a way to dismiss the text, I think. Oh, yeah, I, I agree 100%. Yeah. Well, Gary, I know we're coming up on the hour, uh, and this was fascinating, and I'm glad that we were able to get together this morning and, and talk through this because, yeah, I, I think this is a topic that a lot of people don't want to hear. Yeah. This is a topic that is very difficult for a lot of Protestants to hear because even if they're in a faith tradition that doesn't necessarily believe this concept – of once saved, always saved. Like I said, it's still just kind of floating in the ether behind their head because it's just so, uh, uh, it's just everywhere in yeah. Protestantism. And I think uh, you, I guarantee you, there's Catholics that are in this boat too, um, unfortunately, just those that are poorly, poorly catechized. Um, yeah, it's, so, it's one of those teachings too, Brian, that's kind of, it imprisons you within this thought system. Because I, when I ever I talk this or discuss this with someone that believes in one saved, always saved, see, the problem is they're putting their faith in their faith. They're putting their belief that they're going to be saved based on the fact that they believe that they're going to be saved. So to even question or doubt it is like taboo, because if I even question this doctrine, then that might imply I'm not truly saved. And so it, it's it's almost like you know, there's a cultic element to it, right? Like mind control element to it, because there's this barrier where you can't step back and say, okay, let me really assess whether the Bible is teaching this or not, because there's that fear factor that if I even question it or look into it, then maybe I'm not saved, which is yeah. untrue. Yeah. And I think, I, I think you're, you're, 
you're hitting it on uh, you're hitting the, the uh, nail on the head there because I think even anything we do in life, especially when our core beliefs are questioned and we're having to account for it and someone's saying something that we're like, wow, I don't know about that. Um, we have two reactions and it's either to cower, cower and turn away and just not even look at it or go head on and go, wait, no, let's look into this and let's see if my belief system stands up to what this person is saying. Yeah. And that is a really 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 difficult thing to do um it is not easy to uh at any point I, th I think the younger you are the easier it is because you're more pliable but especially if you're a, a you know in your 20s 30s 40s 50s 60s uh it gets harder and harder because you're so set in your ways and your belief system that if somebody starts questioning it you'd rather just ignore it and turn away and I think that goes for this concept. I think that goes for people looking into the Catholic church sometimes where they just go, Oh no, they're right there. But I, then I got to do too much work and I I've got to completely uh, tear down my belief system and build it back up again. And I've, I I'm, I'm too scared to do that. Yeah. 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 And the funny thing is uh, there's so much that we hold in common with non-Catholics, uh, non-Catholic Christians, right? So it isn't like you're tearing down your belief in Jesus and all that stuff. It really, what it is, is you're getting a fullness to it, right? right. Is that, and I think that's your experience, too. It wasn't yeah, so much 100%. that you got rid of stuff. It's more like you just have more. It added. It, it's like I was living in the uh, cookhouse outside the mansion, and I walked outside the <laughs> cooking house and went, oh, I can go in there. Awesome. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, I think we, we've, I've mentioned that before, I think on your show, the, uh, um, the Steve Ray uh, analogy with the boat, yeah. um, and going, Hey, how come that massive, beautiful ship is over there in horizon? Why aren't we over there? And, uh, and that everything good that Protestants have, they got it off the, the Catholic boat when it started sailing and then people started jumping off and building their own rafts from it. So, um, yeah. I think, yeah, I, I feel like, um, yeah, I think it's important to keep these dialogues up and keep talking about this. And and for us to be kind to our Protestant brothers and sisters when we're really challenging a core belief with them, but still being firm and go, no, this is really what it is. Um, because I think it's a disservice to them. Um, but you still have to, you still have to have that um, be gracious with it because it's it's not easy for a lot of people and especially if they've believed this their entire life yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah so oh. yeah just gotta terribly ch share these things with them yep that that's the whole point um so i know we're we're coming up on an hour here and i wanted to take some time what do you have going on uh i know uh you're you're uh guests on uh who's it's cresta in the afternoon every now and then you're a guest yeah. host in there you already did that once this year what else do you have going on in the works oh uh writing two books simultaneously uh one on the messiah and uh one on the sacrifice of the mass um i also started a Substack, so i'm i'm publishing articles and so on, on Substack, and i'm on patreon and of course the apocrypha apocalypse on youtube um, where we dive into all issues, deuterocanonical, you know, exploring why Catholic and Orthodox Bibles have seven books that Protestant and Jewish Bibles don't. So that's been keeping me really, really busy as well. Yep. And I love, I love that channel. And I'm glad, I'm glad to hear you're, you've got, how do you do two books at once? I, <laughs> I, I, Very slowly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could imagine. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the Messiah book has a deadline, so I'm actually doing more work on that than the other one that and the sense. other one is just basic my books brian you know it usually comes over like years of research that i just have so much i just need to organize it and put it on paper so right. it's not so much research as much it's as, more uh, of putting it together organization yeah yeah that, that makes sense because the research is from uh, from experience is the hardest part about writing uh anything yeah uh, <laughs> Yeah. And if you have that, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely easier. Well, I'm definitely going to, uh, I'll have links below to Gary's uh, YouTube channel, uh, Apocrypha Apocalypse. 
uh, your, I'll, I'll put your website down there. And if you want to send me your stacked, um, uh, link to, um, okay. I'll definitely put that down there. Um, but definitely check Gary out of wealth of knowledge and Gary, I really do appreciate you coming on and uh, diving into this topic and spending the whole time in scripture on a Saturday morning. So yeah. what, uh, what a way to, to start do, it. right? Yeah, exactly. 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 Well, Gary, thanks. And everyone, please like, share, and subscribe. And we'll talk to you all later.